Good evening. Ten days ago, there was a startling announcement from NASA. It was said that we might at last have found the first proofs of past life on the planet Mars. Now, here's a picture of Mars, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see there the white polar cap, the dark areas, and the red deserts. In the 1970s, the Viking probes went there and sent back pictures like this, showing what are almost certainly dry riverbeds. Well, you can't have running water upon Mars now. There isn't enough atmosphere. And therefore, if they really are dry riverbeds, then Mars must once have been a great deal less unfriendly than it is now. But, of course, the question of life there, either past or present, is quite another matter. This comes from a meteorite found in Antarctica, ALH 84001. It's been there for many thousands of years, and the suggestion is it was blasted away from Mars by the impact of an asteroid and finally landed on the Earth. And deep inside it, there's a small feature, which you can call a fossil, if you like, which might indicate the presence there of past life. Well, I don't know. Professor Colin Pillager, if you making a very close study of this, welcome to the sky at night, Colin. Nice First of all, uh, has there been anything new since the NASA announcement? To be absolutely honest, we've been so inundated by the media that we haven't had time to do any work, and uh, our, our interview list runs to almost 10 pages now. Mm -hmm. But if you surf around on the, news, the, the internet, you'll, on your, the web, you'll find that one or two people are saying that they've done so-and-so, which uh, is relevant or, or not relevant. Well, I've got two burning questions. First of all, can you be absolutely certain that this meteorite found in Antarctica does come from Mars? Well, I know you're a skeptic. Yes, I am, I admit, but um, are you? That's more important. <laughs> well, no, because uh, we were the, amongst the first people who tried to prove these meteorites come from Mars by analysing the small amounts of trapped gas that, contain, that are contained in them yes. and matching them to the, uh, the Viking uh, mass spectrometer data. Now, of course, you can never really be sure because our measurements made on the rock are probably more precise than the measurements made on the exactly. on 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 the Viking on the Martian surface. However, if you really want to be categoric about it, then really what we need to do is to do an isotope measuring experiment on the surface of Mars, not necessarily a return sample, but an isotope measurement there to match with the isotopes of the rock we have here, and particularly of oxygen, which is 45% of the rock. Well, and the second burning question is. Can you be absolutely sure that this tiny feature inside the meteorite really does indicate past life? Well, now I'm much less sure about that. Um, what the NASA people have done is to stick their neck out a little bit. Right. But what they've, uh, they've built this story up using the series of data points that we, we've probably supplied them with them and other people have uh, uh, contributed. You have this idea that, uh, first of all, there's trapped gas in the atmosphere. And then there's carbonate, which may have been deposited in running water at a temperature suitable for life to have developed. And with the carbonates, whenever we measure them, we find possibly 250 parts per million of organic matter. So they've just taken it a little step further, and they've probably stuck their neck out with some reasonable hope that they're going to be the people who are forever remembered as saying Mars had life on it. Uh, and the Mars had life doesn't mean there's life there now. Uh, definitely had life. This has nothing at all about life being there at the moment. And of course, if there is life, it's going to be extremely primitive. Uh, the evidence that they've got are of very, very primitive organisms, even smaller organisms than the equivalent ones in the, the Earth's ancient rocks, which are found in you know, 3.5 billion year old rocks. Are you quite certain it can't be Earth contamination? I mean, it's been in Antarctic now for a very long time. That's one of the reasons why it's taken 10 years to get to this stage. We have been absolutely heroic in the efforts that we've taken to overcome the problems yes. of making sure people believe that the carbon that we see in this rock is indigenous. And the carbonate is almost certainly indigenous because we've made, made measurements like radiocarbon to show that it's all dead. It certainly can't be I think we can rule that more recent than 50,000 years. Oh, we're going to rule that and what, finally, what about um, uh, other, other meteorites of the same kind? We've got a lovely suite of these things. We've got uh, a dozen of them now in Britain. We've got a lovely sample called NACLA, which fell in 1911. Yes. And that's, another, that's, a, a, that's the one in which we actually first found carbonates. Yes. So it's a beautiful specimen to work with to try and find out more about this very exciting prospect. Well, we've got to wait and see. I suppose we'll only find out for certain when we get a, an unmanned probe, we get a sample back from Mars. I don't know whether that will be, but I hope fairly soon. Colin, thank you very much indeed. Now we've got to wait for further results. It is fascinating and certainly a very intriguing possibility. Colin, thank you very much.
there had been another interesting announcement also, and this concerns Jupiter's icy satellite Europa, a bit smaller than our moon, uh, been imaged very recently by the Galileo probe now going around Jupiter, and there's a most remarkable picture. The suggestion been made, not for the first time, that beneath this icy, cracked surface, there may be an ocean of liquid water in which there might even be primitive life. Well, I must admit, I take that idea with a very large grain of cosmic salt, but we don't really know. Uh, next December, we're going to do a major program about Jupiter and its system, and we'll come back to it then. Meanwhile, on to our main theme, which again is linked up with the quest for inter interplanetary life. Infrared astronomy is now one of the most important branches of astronomical science. It can image our warm and cool bodies, and of course, a great deal of the infrared radiation coming from space can't get down to the Earth's surface, it's blocked out by our atmosphere, and therefore, to a large extent, we have to use spacecraft. In 1983, up went the infrared astronomical satellite, IRS, which was a tremendous success and mapped the entire sky in infrared. But it operated for less than a year, and since then, nothing comparable until now. On November 17th last year, up went ISO, the Infrared Space Observatory, and that was put into a rather special kind of path around the Earth that carried it from more than 43,000 miles up to only a bit more than 600 miles in a period of 24 hours. And there's a very good reason for that. The Earth is surrounded by zones of radiation um, which do sensitive equipment no good at all. And for 16 of its 24 hours, uh, ISO is above that radiation so it can send back information. At this stage, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Helen Walker of the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, who is very deeply concerned with ISO. Welcome to the sky at night, Helen. Thank you. First of all, what can ISO do that IRS couldn't? Well, IRS was, as you say, a short-lived satellite. Before IRS flew, we had a very limited knowledge of the infrared sky. Um, at the longest wavelength you can access from the ground, we knew about 2,300 sources. And then after IRAS had flown at the same sort of wavelength, 12 microns, which is the shortest IRAS can do, we had almost 160,000. And of course, as you say, we have a point source catalog from it with almost a quarter of a million. And now ISO, we hope ISO is going to find out a lot more about many of those objects from the IRAS catalog. It's a much more sophisticated satellite. It has much wider wavelength coverage. We have four instruments on board ISO, um, two spectrometers, which of course is something that IRAS has not really very much capability to do anything seriously about spectra, although of course mm. we did get some very interesting results from their low resolution spectrometer. We have a camera and we have a photometer which goes out to 200 microns, again much longer wavelength than IRAS managed. And we have the longer lifetime. We're going to be hopefully operating for two years now. We were very lucky because with the looking at the infrared, we have to cool the satellite. And the technicians in French Guiana filled the thermos flask around our ISO so well that instead of 18 months, we're hoping now for two years. That's all to the good. Well, results are coming back now, some indeed from our own solar system, some from the lovely ringed planet Saturn, for example. Yes, um, Saturn is something we think we know quite a lot about, and yet even here we've had some pleasant surprises. Um, with the long wavelength spectrometer, Do Dr. Matt Griffin and his colleagues have been looking at the atmosphere of Saturn, and what we found is that with um, ammonia, which is an important component of the atmosphere, and that's NH3, we have um, about the abundance, the amount of ammonia in the atmosphere that we expected. But with phosphine, pH3, um, we've had quite a surprise because the phosphine abundance is much greater than expected and also the actual distribution in the atmosphere is different. Um, there doesn't seem to be very much phosphine in the stratosphere, mainly down in the other parts of the atmosphere. Um, again, we've been looking at molecular hydrogen and the form that we can look at now, because uh, of course you can't look at this molecule from the ground, is the deuterated molecular hydrogen. This is an ordinary atom of hydrogen along with an atom of deuterium, that's a heavy hydrogen. And this has proved um, quite a surprise because you can use this molecule to find how much deuterium there is in the atmosphere of Saturn 
and this is much smaller than the amount the Galileo probe found for Jupiter. Of course, both the Galileo result and the ISA result are preliminary, so we hope the discrepancy won't remain quite as large as it is now. Well, we'll see. Meanwhile, let's go beyond our own solar system. Look straight up overhead now when the sky is clear and you'll see the lovely blue star Vega. And way back in 1983, this was studied by the IRS satellite and found to be associated with cool, possibly planet-forming material. This is an artist's impression, of course, but Vega could be like that. Well, since then, nothing until now. Uh, what's ISO going to tell us about Vega and the stars like it? Well, the artist's impression actually gives us quite a good idea of what we understand about the dust disk in that it does have a central gap which is about 50 astronomical units across. And one astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the Earth. And then we have this extended ring of dust. And of course, with IRAS, we couldn't actually see the ring of dust. We, we just knew there was um, warm emission from it. Now with ISO, um, with the photometer, I've actually been able to image the disk. Um, what we're seeing here are two different wavelengths with the photometer and the actual image is larger than you'd find for a star and so we're actually starting to see the dust disk although it's still blurred with the passage through the telescope itself the instrumental profile so you don't actually see a central hole yet but we have several other um, stars of the same class which have these dust disks and some of them have complex molecules as well and of course I suppose the best candidate is the southern star Beta Pictoris that you can't see from here, it's too far south um, yes, Beta Pictoris is the only one of these type of stars where we've actually seen the disk sort of edge on in scattered light. Um, of course, we can't see it at the moment with ISO. Um, it's rather strange because ISO must never look at the sun or the earth or the moon. Um, we can't look at Beta Pictoris at the moment. We're going to have to wait until next <laughs> July, which is uh, some trial of patience. <laughs> Somewhat frustrating. <laughs> but I suppose uh, infrared really comes into its own when you're studying areas of star formation, where new stars are being born. Yes, indeed. Um, the area of star formation in particular, all four instruments on ISO are able to make quite an impact on this. Um, we have, for example, with the camera, pictures of the area of star formation near Rho or Fucus. And this is a very beautiful picture from the camera, thanks to the Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale in Paris and the Service d'Astrophysique. We have here a picture of the sort of edge of the nebula, where again you can see emission from complex molecules, but also we have the small smudges, each of which is a place where a new star is being born except for the one large smudge near the middle, which is a um, place where a star about 100 times as massive as the sun is forming. This is sort of one of the modes we can use for ISO. Another opportunity we have is to take spectra. And here, when we look at um, another young star in the nebula, NGC 7538, we actually see the amazing variety of molecules that there are in a nebula near a new star. For example, we have the water ice, H2O, and then we also have um, methanol, CHO3OH, and we have um, different ice features from carbon dioxide ice, that's CO2, plus the CO gas as well, carbon monoxide. Again, we have a nitrile feature, XCN, and another feature, which is um, HCOOH, which is formic acid, mm. mixed in with water ice. And these two features, the nitrile and formic acid, are interesting because they're prebiotic molecules. And so this is um, a new aspect, perhaps, of um, chemistry in these clouds. Additionally, of course, we have features we don't know what they are yet. And uh, we have to be quite honest and say this is definitely something, but we don't know what. And we have um, other features as well. We have the methane gas, CH4, plus silicate dust features. And, of course, this is the sort of laboratory on which all these molecules will interact. And from studying sort of molecules like these and the other features we have in the spectrum, we can build up a much better picture of the chemistry of these new clouds where stars are forming and possibly even new solar systems. What about the very old stars? Well, again, um, ISO has made a big impact on this. Um, Mike Barlow's group have been studying NGC 7027, which is 
a star getting towards the end of its life. The HST picture shows all the gas and dust being blown off from it, sort of the blue haze and the central emission areas. But again, we've got sort of new observations. We know this is a place where there is a lot of carbon, and so we expect to see carbon lines and lines of carbon monoxide, CO. But there was a surprise, um, which Mike Barlow's group found, which was the water vapor, H2O. And it was um, known that any oxygen in this nebula would combine with the carbon to form CO. But we didn't expect any oxygen to be left over to mix with the hydrogen. And of course, what Mike Barlow's group have now found is that there is a region where the temperature is high enough to separate the carbon and oxygen, so that there is some free oxygen to combine with hydrogen and form this water vapour. Water vapour, of course, is something we can't study from the Earth because of the water vapour in our own atmosphere. And even on Mauna Kea and with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, we can't separate the Earth's water vapour from that in astronomical sources. And so um, this is a new area. And with W Hydra, which is a very old star, uh, coming to the end of its life, it's about 2,700 degrees, we have many, many lines of water vapour. These are all the peaks on the graph. And of course now with ISO we can actually see all these water vapour lines and model them. And the actual match of the peaks on the spectrum of the peaks in the model is very good indeed. And so we have a much better understanding of how these evolved stars are actually working. The final stage, of course, is supernova remnants. And here we have a less well-known supernova remnant. This actually comes from an X-ray catalogue, and so has an exciting name of MSH 11-54. And Richard Tuff's group has been looking at this, and what they find is that the central emission from ISO, from the photometer, matches up with the X-ray emission. But we have extra features which are caused by the material from the supernova remnant colliding with interstellar dust and clouds and heating up this dust. So, of course, um, ISO sees it very clearly. Well, these objects are in our own galaxy. What about other galaxies? For example, here's a picture of the Whirlpool Galaxy drawn by the third Earl of Ross with his homemade telescope 150 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. What about star formation in other galaxies? Well, of course, um, we've been able to make um, quite a survey even here and this is um, of course one of our nearer neighbours, uh, one of the first objects studied by ISO and you can see in the optical that the satellite galaxy at the bottom is quite bright and quite large but when we go to the infrared we actually find that it's much more compact and this is because the satellite galaxy has a lot of star formation taking place but it's mainly in the nucleus of it and so we see this small object and, of course, the satellite has influenced the main galaxy. Um, and that has actually meant, again, that there is more star formation in this galaxy than we would expect. This is a fairly mild interaction. When we go to something like the antennae galaxies, where you see um, these streamers pulled out by the two galaxies interacting with each other, we see the sort of more dramatic situation. And what the ISO camera has found is that you see the nuclei of the two galaxies uh, with extra star formation, but in the overlap region we see even more star formation, and so they're brighter. And there is one bright spot where the sort of energy just keeps increasing, and so when we move from the camera to the photometer, we actually find that um, the energy is brighter as we go into the longer wavelengths than we would expect. And this, of course, links up that with the old IRAS satellite, we knew as we got to the longer wavelengths that the energy was increasing. But we didn't expect that when we got to 200 microns that the energy level would be so high. We thought it would fall off. And this is all coming from this bright spot. And it's the dust being heated up by the extra stars being formed due to the interaction. We also have star formation in our own galaxy. And the mammoth is a rather exciting object because it's exactly similar to the Orion region. In, it's about 20 parsecs across and very similar, except that it's 8 kiloparsecs away from us. So it's about the same distance from us as we are from the galactic centre. Roughly so, 30,000 light years, something like that. Yes, yeah, so a long way away. And it's, as I say, it's very, very similar to Orion. So uh, although Orion is unique in our neighbourhood, it's not unique in the galaxy. 
And next door to the mammoth, we have had uh, really quite a shock. And this is um, Jerry Gilmore's group's work. And he's called this particular region Big Blue. And the blue is a computer color rather than something intrinsic in the sky. And it's like trying to look through a brick. We have a very dense patch of dust and gas here, which might be the site of star formation in the future. And we're finding these very dense patches all around this sort of galactic plane. And it's rather like looking at the Milky Way. There are dark patches. We should be seeing here, very close to the galactic center, masses of normal stars. And we do see vast numbers of normal stars. But we also see these small, dense patches um, blotting out the starlight, um, which is a bit strange at um, the longer wavelengths in the infrared. Uh, we thought we'd be seeing all the way through. You know, when IRIS operated for most of 1983, in addition to carrying out his official program, which included a complete infrared map of the sky, it made uh, many discoveries that simply were not expected. Now, I just wonder, what do you expect that may come out of ISO that you didn't really, really anticipate when you launched it? Well, it's still very early days, but I think one of the areas where we may get a big shock is actually with the serendipity survey with the isophotometer. Um, in in between sort of target positions, um, we have to move the satellite. And so rather than just slew across the sky, we switch on the long wavelength part of the isophotometer, which is a small camera. And so as we move from one target to the next, we may slew over something else. And in this case, uh, we were doing a test on the coma cluster of galaxies where we knew the chances were very high that we'd find something else. And indeed, there is a sort of small galaxy along the track. And of course, what we find here is that we have four detectors in this camera array. And as they move across the galaxy, they respond to it. And we see a little peak in the signal. And we can use the fact that there is more than one detector to rule out the possibility of a sort of chance event. And so this really is an astronomical object we're finding. So we can use this to look for objects near the galactic plane, stars, or faint galaxies out of the plane, and we can even map the very cool clouds in between the stars. And of course, um, it's early days. We, we don't know exactly where we're going to slew at any given time, but we've already had five months of operation, and we can see the sort of blue scan tracks across large portions of the um, universe. And uh, somewhere in there, there could be something very exciting. Well, I'm quite sure, so, and if so, I'm sure I so will find it. It had been an outstanding success, and there's a long way to go yet. Helen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, dial up the Sky at Night Information Line, 0891 800 or CFAX page 615. And when I come back next month, we're going to return to an entirely different kind of subject. Exactly 150 years ago, the planet Neptune was discovered by mathematical calculation. So when I come back next month, I'm going to tell you about the extraordinary story of the discovery of Neptune. So until then, good night.